All right, so ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce Eric Hirschfeld, the author, or is it one of the authors? Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, of the just recently published, I think it was published like two or three weeks ago. 4th of so April. 4th of April, yeah. yeah. Well, that was a good estimate. <laughs> and um, the world's rarest bird. I may beat a coin and uh, give a t shirt <laughs> of our bird fair to you. Thank you. As a small present. Thank you very much. Thank you. Tonight he's signing the book in the uh, Landkreis of Carlo, uh, where we have our, let's say, social event of the whole fair. And, well, yeah. Thank you mm -hmm. for coming. And Thank you. So I got the t shirt now, so. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know if it fits. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yeah, this is the book. You may have seen it in the shop. It is available after the lecture in the shop here as well, if anyone is interested. My name is Eric Horsfeldt. I come from Sweden. I'm also involved in the Falsterbo Bird Show, which we have in, in the first weekend of September every year. And, and I'm going to tell you a bit about this book, but more about the birds and the classification system of endangered birds. What is an endangered bird? Is it any bird or what? Here. Uh, oh, maybe this is not the right talk. The <laughs> uh, no, it is actually. Uh, <clears throat> I was working with a friend a couple of years ago on a book called The Malt Whiskey Yearbook, uh, which uh, describes the malt whiskey industry. There are 130 distilleries. It's published every year. And he writes in Swedish and I write in English. And then we sell it in Scotland and uh, in the UK mainly. When we were doing that book, we were talking, can we do something similar about birds and the same concept, about 130, 150 birds, and uh, I came up with the idea of the Rare Birds Yearbook, that we would every year make a book about the 190 rarest birds of the world, the critically endangered ones. <coughs> so we did that uh, for two years, 2008 and 2009. It was sold in 40 countries. We had big problems selling in, in the USA because it's very difficult as an independent publisher to sell books in America. Uh, but we saw quite okay in, in the UK, and we renewed this book every year. Um, <clears throat> but then um, I met Andy Swash, who was one of the contributing photographers to these books, and we decided, he's a publisher also in, in the UK, and we decided that together we would write the world's rarest birds, which would not be a yearbook, but it would um, come out once with all the critically endangered and the endangered and the data deficient species. To, to make these books, I ran photo competitions on the internet, so people could upload photos of rare birds, not at nests or in the cases where they would disturb the birds, but to decently taken photos. And we could use them in the book and in our lectures. And they were quite big successes. We got many photos in, in that way, and we could present each rare bird with a photograph. And we kept this concept for the world's rarest birds. Now, there are two organizations in the world which are involved in the conservation of wildlife on a global scale, and I think you're aware of the IUCN in, in Switzerland, and BirdLife International, who are working on the bird. And these are the organizations who decide the classification, whether a bird is vulnerable, critically endangered, data deficient, or whatever. I'll come to the categories shortly. <coughs> BirdLife uh, produces the suggestion for IUCN which species should be considered as endangered, and every year this is revised and, and added on. The different categories are, on the top, the ones which are extinct, they're already gone, like the dodo, uh, the ones which are extinct in the wild, because some species, they do not occur in the wild any longer, but they are captive populations, which are quite important if you want to reintroduce them. Critically endangered, these were the species we covered in the rare birds yearbooks, and which is covered in the world's rarest birds, Endangered uh, was not in the yearbooks, but is in the world's rarest birds here. And in total, this is around 590 species, critically and endangered. Vulnerable, they're also threatened, but they're not in the book. There are so many uh, of them, unfortunately. Near threatened, then we have the ones called least concerned, which, uh, well, there is no issue with them, which we know of. And the ones which are data deficient, which may be common, may belong to the least concerned category, but we know so very little of them because they are in areas where not many people are. 
So looking at the total situation, we have about 10,000 different species. 130 are extinct since 1500, which we know of. Uh, 197 are critically endangered and 389 are endangered. So including the vulnerable, over 1,300 species are at great risk. That's uh, more than one in every 10 species of birds in the world. And <coughs> the other ones here are not uh, considered at risk at the moment. This is an example of an extinct species. This is a snail eating koa. It's lived on a small island of uh, Madagascar, and it's a ground cuckoo, but it's not a parasitic one. It disappeared in 1834 because this island was used by humans, pirates especially, had a base there, and they brought in mammals, and also they, they killed the, some of the wildlife there, including this species, which is gone. So we can never bring that one back. <coughs> An example of a species which is extinct in the wild is a Hawaiian crow. There used to be five species of crow on, Hawaii, on the Hawaii Islands, but there's only one left now, and it doesn't occur in the wild. It's only bred in captivity in uh, San Diego Zoo, among other places. Uh, this one will be reintroduced very shortly. Uh, it was very vulnerable because uh, the young, they left the nest very early, and they lived on the ground, so they were easy prey when people came with cats and, and rats to these islands. But we're hoping that it will come back soon, and uh, it will definitely be critically endangered once it is released, and then hopefully it can be off the endangered list eventually. A species which is critically endangered is the New Zealand storm petrel, and maybe you're aware about this story. It was gone for 150 years, and in 2003, uh, some of these birds were seen in, in New Zealand, but they, no one knew where they were breeding or anything. But just a few weeks ago, they found the first breeding site of them, and they breed on islands off this bay in New Zealand where they were found. And they are critically endangered because they have a very small population. But it's one which uh, came back from the dead. A species which is not as endangered as the critical ones, an endangered one, this is the eastern bristol bird from Australia. Uh, it's, it's not a migrant bird, so it's very dependent on these areas where it lives, and they have been uh, fragmented, so the populations cannot move over large areas in, in short steps, and they will not migrate long places to, to a suitable breeding habitat. There are a couple of subspecies of it, uh, and it's currently endangered, uh, uncertain what the trend is. Have you seen this one in Austria? I don't think so. I don't think so, no. It's an arctic eider. Uh, it's the Stellar's Eider. When I started bird watching in Sweden in the late 70s, we would see maybe 200 of these every winter all around the country. Now, uh, 30 years later, uh, we see maybe 15, 20 a good year. Uh, but it may be that it's just locally rare in Sweden. Uh, but it's considered vulnerable because uh, it breeds in the Arctic and you know with the global warming and the changing of the water conditions of the food sources. Um, it is definitely threatened. It's a very beautiful bird in male. <coughs> the red kite, this one is near threatened. And I'll take this as an example because in my country this species has been critically endangered. And each country can have its own list, but this book is only referring from the global context. So some countries may classify species in different ways. I'm not sure it's the same in, in Austria here. Mm -hmm. The red kite um, is near threatened. It's doing quite okay. There's a successful project in, in the UK as well, reintroducing them. I think it's successful still. Yes. yes. Yeah. See it here too. Yeah. And here I took least concern because uh, if you show this for people who are not birders, they will be a bit offended because the flamingo is so beautiful. How can we call it least concern? But it's a very numerous species. Um, and it's not doesn't have any specific threat, although there may be threats at certain sites where they breed, but they also move around in the breeding areas. And this is the emerald starling, uh, which occurs in Sierra Leone uh, and two other states in West Africa. And this bird may be quite common, but we know very little of it because uh, there has not been much research on it. And it's a very popular cage bird as well. So possibly it is threatened by the cage bird trade. But uh, an example of a species that stayed at the fission. <coughs> now, looking at the book, I'll just explain these QR codes here. Um, 
they link directly into the latest, the full information about the species on the web in BirdLife's database. So if you have a QR reader in your iPad or your iPhone, you can easily get the, the full information about the species because we are a bit limited in space in the book. Now, look at the Imperial Amazon. It's endangered and 160 to 240 individuals. The sociable lapwing, which I think turns up here occasionally, um, rarely, yeah. <laughs> is uh, critically endangered, but the population is 11,000. It's much more common. So why is this? Any ideas? Well, you can see the trend. The arrow is pointing down for the sociable lapwing, and it's green and pointing up for the Amazon. The Amazon is kind of under control. It's uh, being monitored and uh, doing quite well. Uh, <clears throat> when you assess, or when the BirdLife assesses a species, what kind of category it is, they will look in these kind of classification system. You see the, the classification on the left side and the number of species which are affected by them. So a species can be affected by each category here. At geological events, this is like earthquakes and stuff, not many species are affected by that, or volcanoes. Uh, I think the other ones are quite um, explanatory. Fire management, when, when bushfires get out of control and things like that. Uh, invasive and other problematic species, this is like when people come to islands and introduce mammals, or also different plants which might compete, uh, natural plant. Um, which is an important food source for one animal and then um, um, a plant which has been introduced um, takes over and uh, is not a, such a good food source for the birds or the animals. <coughs> Looking at the threat categories, this is the most threatened bird. It's a Reunion Harrier, which lives on the island of Reunion. It has quite rounded wings for being a harrier because it's adapted to flying in between trees and bushes, hunting, so it has to be able to maneuver very quickly. Uh, and it is affected by all these categories is threatening it. Population is still quite okay, but uh, it's still it's, uh, endangered. But a uh, lot of things to take into consideration here when protecting this species. I should say on agriculture, aquaculture, that's also uh, commercial fish uh, uh, breeding. Various species of fish which destroy habitat and, and also uh, eat up chicks, etc. Uh, <clears throat> now I'm going to go into the different continents. Now I'm going to show some examples of three uh, species from each geographical region here. When we talk about South America, the hot spots where the most issues are with, with endangered birds is in the Choco region between uh, Colombia and Ecuador, in Peru, and the Amazonian basin. And um, in total, there are 3,250 species in South America, uh, 168 of them are critically endangered or endangered, and one is extinct in the wild, which is the Spix macaw, which is being reintroduced this summer into Brazil after a very successful breeding project. One of the few positive things I'm, I'm I will be talking about. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so these are the hot spots. <coughs> I'm <coughs> taking an example here of the Titicaca grebe, which occurs in the lake Titicaca, which lies in the Andes. Uh, this is one threatened species because this is a flightless grebe, so it cannot move. Lake Titicaca is used very much locally from people in uh, the different countries around it. Uh, it is used for shipping, it's used for fishing. Um, fishes have been introduced which are not native to the area and they eat greed chicks. Uh, it is also polluted like some other Andean lakes from mining. A lot of waste material from mines go into the lakes and change the whole ecosystem. And as it cannot fly, it's not easy for it to, to find another place to, to live in. There's also the Yunin grebe in Lake Yunin in Peru also, which is in the same kind of situation, but even more endangered. The Lear's macaw. This uh, was also a bird that was gone. I talked about the New Zealand storm petrel being gone for 150 years, and it's the same case with the, with the Lear's macaw. Um, it occurs in Brazil. It's an uh, Amazonian species. And uh, the reason why uh, this species is very threatened is uh, partly the, the bird trade because it's a very popular species to keep in captivity. 
And during these 150 years, when it was not seen, birds turned up in, in the trade industry all the time. It's called Lear's Macaw, after the British poet Lear, who, uh, apart from writing poems, also liked to draw macaws very much. It's specialized in feeding on a special nut from palms called Likuri nuts. The marvelous spatula tail is a Peruvian hummingbird, and uh, this species is, is quite peculiar with these long tails here, which uh, have a uh, sexual selection significance for the females. Also, they're very, very easy to target for kids with slingshots, and it's quite popular uh, trying to target the males. And this may result in a skewed sex ratio, so there are more females than males, and of course this uh, causes havoc on the whole breeding system of this species. This species. North America, there are two main areas. One is uh, the Caribbean and the other one is the Mexico. And then we have Hawaii, but I include Hawaii in a region which we have inv invented, which is called Oceanic Islands. And we put that in one region because the threats are, are very typical for in common with all these islands. 1,912 species recorded. Uh, extinct in the wild, none, but we have, for example, in North America, the passenger pigeon, which was an extremely numerous bird, which just went down like this in the early 20th century. Well, it started earlier, but the last one died in the uh, early 20th century. Um, <clears throat> I should say also that North America is the second country in the world with most endangered species, and this is if we count Hawaii in. So the first one is Brazil. Second one is North America, or USA, and the third one is Indonesia, which is very close to the USA. But looking uh, <coughs> to North America here, the California condor, um, this is partly a success story. Um, it used to be quite common along the, the western coast of America, California, and, and northwards, um, but disappeared quite rapidly, and there were many reasons for that, but one was persecution. Um, and in 1987, the last ones were brought into captivity because there was a monitored captive population which genetically could be controlled and different individuals could breed with each other. And they were released again, and now they are spreading again, but quite frequently birds have to be taken into care because they become poisoned, because people still poison um, dead animals uh, to get rid of um, uh, foxes and, uh, and other mammals, and that will affect them as well. As well as uh, lead bullets um, or lead hail, because when hunting, for example, ground squirrels in America, they use hail with lead, and they let the ground squirrels be on the ground, and the vultures will come and eat them, and they get the lead all ingested. So several of the birds which have been released have been brought back and uh, de-leaded. <laughs> This is a species which occurs in uh, Alaska and Canada, and this is the marbled murrelet. Um, this is an Arctic species, and uh, it is partly affected by the climate change and the temperature in the waters, which are changing the food uh, pattern for it, or the availability of food. But also, it's very strange, because it breeds in old trees far inland, away from the water. It will fly 40, 50 kilometers to a nest. And it has to be a very old tree with the thick branches, and there has to be a certain moss on the branches, and it will lay its egg where it finds a good place in this tree. Uh, so <clears throat> being a, um, not just living in the sea, but also in the forest, it is affected by threats from two different places. And this is the most recently photographed ivory built woodpecker. Well, it's actually a piece of art by Tomasz Kosta, who has done all the illustrations in the book. He makes very realistic uh, paintings of these birds. Uh, do you think this one occurs? We have a poll here. Anyone believe in this species? You? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I'm a bit skeptical um, because it's been so difficult to, to prove. Uh, there have been lots of reports about ivory billed woodpeckers in Louisiana and Florida. Recently, on some with recordings and poor photographs, but no one can take a good photograph or make a good recording. However, the forests in these areas are returning back to their original state. So maybe if there are ivory-billed woodpeckers around, they could come back if they are around. 
there was also a population in Cuba which we know very little of, but which is presumed to be extinct. Looking towards Asia, the hotspots here are the Philippines and Indonesia. And Indonesia, as I mentioned before, is the country with the third most, uh, the highest number of endangered species. And another problem is the flyway between Siberia and uh, Southeast Asia. And here, due to the very rapid development in China, also Russia, and, um, and other Southeast Asian countries, the coastlines are changing. I think you heard about the problems in Korea, where they are filling in large tidal mudflats for construction, or for fish dams, or for shrimp, uh, or prawn uh, farming, if you were further south in Southeast Asia. And that takes away these mudflats, which are extremely important habitats for migrating waders between Siberia and even all the way down to Australia. So think about that when you eat uh, prawns and, and things, that's these big prawns. Try to avoid them. There are a few of them which are ecologically and sustainably uh, grown. <coughs> 3,100 species, around 130 which are critically endangered or endangered. <coughs> the white trunk vulture. Um, there are several vulture species in India, uh, Pakistan, to Cambodia and Vietnam. And um, <coughs> extremely common, and one, one of them has been believed to be one of the most common birds, but mm -hmm. they have crashed horribly, and I think you've probably heard about this in, in the bird news as well, during <coughs> the last year. And the reason for this is um, a medicine called the diclofenac, which is given to cattle to avoid um, its anti-inflammatory. Uh, I had a colleague at work who had a back pain, and I was reading on, on our medicine, and it says diclofenac on that, so we use it as well. So. If you're going to donate your body after you die to become vulture food, don't eat stick to the before, before that, that's for sure. Anyway, uh, enormously rapid declines, and they take time to recover because they lay one egg, they take long time to become mature. But breeding centers are now set up in several places in India and Pakistan where they're doing very well, and vultures have also been released out into the wild very recently. Now, diclofenac can be substituted with another medicine, which probably is quite okay, and which will not affect the vultures, and diclofenac has been banned in India and Pakistan. However, we can see now in Africa that diclofenac is being used, and we don't know exactly how the African vultures are doing. I will come back to that a bit later. <coughs> the spoonbill sandpiper, all bird watchers' favorite bird, I think. Um, very charismatic, um, <coughs> around 200 individuals left, and this is one of the species which is threatened by the destruction of the flyway of the coast of China and Southeast Asia. So, a uh, uh, reintroduction project or a breeding project running at Slimbridge in the UK. Um, so, hopefully, there will be at least a captive population if they disappear from the wild. Mm -hmm. But also, they occur over very large areas, and there were new birds found in China just a few weeks ago. Uh, so there could be more than these 200, but they are extremely vulnerable. Also on the breeding grounds, they are quite specialized, and uh, with the global warming and the tundra melting and the permafrost disappearing, it will of course affect the species too. Another trade bird species, the yellow-crested cockatoo, um, which occurs on the, <coughs> the Philippines. There is also a, a feral population in Hong Kong, and it's quite common as a cage bird. So there, is, there are birds in, in captivity which can uh, supplement the wild birds. Uh, it is um, hunted for the cage bird trade, but also it is considered a pest because they will feed on, on crop and maize and things, and local farmers, of course, will not like this very much. Moving on to Australia, the hotspots there is mainly New Zealand. Uh, there are endangered birds in Australia as well, but New Zealand is very special because the birds in New Zealand had a very long time to adapt without humans. And when humans arrived in New Zealand and brought new animals over, they were severely affected by that. One of them is the northern brown kiwi, which has recently been split. The brown kiwi was two different species. Uh, very odd birds, active during night, have extremely good uh, smelling sense and uh, their eyesight is incredibly poor. They won't uh, uh, see more than a few centimeters. 
but they have a very sensible tip of the bill and uh, the smell, and they bury the dick for worms, earthworms and things. Uh, the male digs a long nest also under earth. The wings are almost non-existent. They are very, very small and difficult to find a kiwi like that. And they are quite heavy birds. They have been very affected since they can't fly. Of course, uh, when cats, dogs, possums and other mam mammals came to New Zealand, they were quite easy prey to find. And they are active at night. <coughs> the red-crested penguin. Um, we're talking about global warming in the Arctic and the effect there, but the same effect is in, the, in uh, the Antarctic as well. This species has only two main breeding colonies, and of course if one of them is, um, is destroyed for some reason, maybe a volcano or an earthquake, it will affect the species very hard. And also they are uh, subjected to oiling and other marine pollution. <laughs> and the kakapoo, this is a winner image from the book. Um, which um, used to be common all around um, mainland New Zealand, but with the mammals, and it, it, it disappeared and also was heavily hunted because the feathers were quite sought after to use. Um, and it is very inquisitive, it's not afraid of humans at all. A population was found on some islands which were mammal free, and now there's a big reintroduction project going on where islands are cleared from mammals, introduced mammals, and then kakapoos are introduced there. They live to 80-90 years of age, and they only breed every fourth year. This year they will not breed because uh, the rimu fruit, which they are feeding on, uh, has, has not set this year. It's not been good at all. So, but last year was quite a good breeding year. Um, they also have a strange for being parrots. They're more like uh, grouse because the male he will make a hollow, and he will call in the hollow with his call for females to come to him, and uh, he will display for them which is unusual behavior for this kind of birds. Uh, the Oceanic Islands, as I said before, we lump them together because um, we think the, the threats are basically the same. One bird here is Amsterdam Albatross. I think you heard about uh, bird life's albatross campaigns where we have to clear up the sea from, from plastic and other things, but also um, not use long line fishing because they are severely affected by albatrosses. These birds, they, they cannot breed every year. They are so slow. So if they breed one year, they have to take the next year off before they breed again. Because the young grow very, very slowly. And they only lay one egg. And that is also why they are very threatened. And they only occur on Amsterdam Island as breeders. And then they roam the seas when they are not breeding. So it's a very vulnerable species. There are about 80 left. One closer to us on the Azores is the bullfinch. Azores bullfinch which is doing quite well. Uh, it has attracted a lot of funding because it's a species close to us, so of course we can all feel for this bird. Not very beautiful, but uh, I think the birders like it a lot. This is an endemic species for the Azores. Um, <coughs> this uh, has actually taken advantage of introduced plants because uh, on the Azores, some of the introduced plants provide extra food source for, for these. So in that case, it's, it's good for this bird, but maybe not for another one. Uh, and also, a uh, proper survey has been made now, and more birds have been found here recently. But it's still endangered, and it's still a bird to look out for. And Hawaiian species, the Akohe Kohe, or how it's pronounced. Um, there are quite a few left, and there's also bred in a captive breeding program, but they are very difficult to breed in captivity because they are aggressive and they do not tolerate each other. You can almost see that when you look at them. It looks a bit aggressive, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, so they're not good to have in confined spaces, spaces. The Hawaiian birds, many of them uh, disappeared because of avian uh, malaria and other diseases which uh, were brought into Hawaii uh, at the same time as humans came there and also brought in feral pigs which destroyed the habitat. So uh, there are many, many species uh, which have the same kind of threat situation on Hawaii as they have. And some of them are already extinct, unfortunately. In Africa, two areas, Madagascar and Angola, um, which are hotspots, 2,000 species, and about 90 are threatened. Uh, this is good news, the Madagascar pochard, which um, was down to very few individuals a couple of years back, but now the number has quadrupled, and I think we have 50, 60 individuals now. It's also bred in captivity. 
Um, and <clears throat> this species was, um, the, the population pressure in Madagascar is quite big uh, around the lakes. And when they refound this species, when they were looking for it, they found it away from its original habitat in small lakes and forests, which weren't, had as much uh, vegetation around them. Uh, and also which did not have invasive fish, because in the main lakes in Madagascar, people have put in fish which give a higher yield when, when you catch them. And these fish will eat duck chicks, and there's one grebe which is extinct from Madagascar, uh, partly because of this. Uh, but this one, uh, there is hope for this one, even though it's still critically endangered. The hooded vulture talked about the Diclofenac issue in uh, South Asia, which probably is coming to Africa as well. But also in Africa, uh, poachers who kill elephants and other protected large animals don't like vultures. So there is also pressure on the vultures from the poachers because when they have a kill, the vultures will come and they will lead the police and the wardens to the kill maybe. And also vultures play a, a traditional role in, in medicine in, in Africa. Various vulture parts are used for uh, various rituals. Um, so the African vultures uh, are threatened. Hooded vulture is the uh, one I chose to show here. Um, in Algeria, a bit closer to us, we have this nuthatch, which is endemic, the Algerian nuthatch. Um, of course, uh, in two places in the Kabylie Mountains. Um, it's probably quite stable, but there is a population pressure on the area where, where it occurs. And it's considered endangered, not critically endangered. Coming to our region, Europe and the Middle East, uh, not so many species here, 13, um, and we don't have any hotspots here, it's more spread out, the various threats. One of the newest ones, which is put up to be endangered, is the velvet scooter, which you might see in Austria sometimes, mm. I think, yeah. Um, because the velvet scooter is going down very rapidly as well, the, the population which is here in, in um, Northern Europe. Uh, one reason for this, if I'm looking in the Swedish perspective, is that it's a very late breeder. They usually lay eggs in, in May and June, and that is the same time when everyone wants to be out with their sailing boats in the archipelago of Stockholm and in the Baltic. It's very crowded with people there, and of course they get disturbed if you land on islands where they breed. But many islands are protected as well, so it's not um, uh, always the case. But uh, also the Siberian populations are going down. So this is one to watch out for. <coughs> the white-headed duck. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the debate with uh, the ruddy duck, the American relative, which was introduced or escaped in Europe and started interbreeding with the white-headed ducks all the way down to Spain. And it's been very controversial if the ruddy duck should be killed or not. And I think there's been a culling. Maybe you know more about yeah. that in the UK and Spain, I'm quite sure. Yes. Yes. When it started off, the Spanish and France actually funded a program. Uh, the Spanish went ahead with it, but the French sort of did because Britain didn't join them. When Britain came in, to, France had forgotten about that, so there may be still some in France, but in Britain yeah. it's been very successful. I think only the estimate about 30 birds left. 30 birds left, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, there is a population in Central Asia as well, which is not affected by the ruddy duck, but there are other issues there um, in Pakistan, among other places, where they winter with lakes, where there is a heavy population as well, and pressure from the population. We saw this in Spain last month. Yeah? Oh, good. Uh, Danioric shearwater uh, breeds around Majorca in the Mediterranean and migrates out to the Bay of Biscay, or used to. Now the Bay of Biscay, the water temperature has changed, the fish stock has changed, so they have to migrate further north. And now in the summer, uh, large numbers occur in the North Sea and in the English Channel between England and France. And a few even turn up in Sweden as well in summer. It's almost annual now, summer and, and early autumn. Um, but <coughs> the main thing here is uh, that the change conditions in, in the sea, the water temperatures have affected the species quite badly. And Okay, it's a good flyer, and if it can fly and find new areas, that's fine. But if it cannot, if the fish will disappear from there as well, then it will be difficult. Then it migrates back into the Mediterranean to breed 
around Majorca and some of these islands are predator free so there are no mammals on them, um, others are not. Are you, are you including the population in Menorca that is declining? Yeah. It's a tiny yeah. population, it may be yeah. separate. Yes, could be. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of work is being done on this taxonomically as well. Mm. So is it all just blue? Or are you feeling depressed? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, I'm not saying that these species are saved already, but the Bali starling, um, here's an <coughs> interesting reintroduction project where it is being reintroduced into an island. Um, it, it breeds on Bali and it's been under large pressure from the cage bird industry because it's been very much sought after. The breeding centres are robbed with, at gunpoint of birds once, uh, 15, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, but now it's been reintroduced to the island with the cooperation of locals on this island and it's doing quite well there and it's breeding and uh, increasing just off Bali. Also there is a large captive population, uh, I was in Berlin a couple of weeks ago, they were in the zoo there and I know in Prague where I lived a couple of years ago there was also in the zoo there. So there is, uh, it is possible uh, to reintroduce it but it had to be let alone in the wild and not caught. Mauritius Fodi is another small um, finch on, on Mauritius, one of its uh, endemic species, uh, which has been successfully reintroduced into a, a, an island off Mauritius, where again it has been cleared from invasive species and it does quite well. And, oh, sorry. <laughs> so it uh, would probably. And the Malaysian duck is another species. Um, <coughs> which occurs in uh, the Pacific um, and this <coughs> is uh, being a duck is uh, quite special because it eats flies it eats brine flies and uh, there are some photos where they are in films where they are walking along a beach and clouds of flies and they are just mm. taking the flies into the bills like this uh, several hundred of them now uh, the last female in the wild had its nest trampled by a curly uh, wader bird and the eggs destroyed and this was uh, a couple of decades ago and uh, she laid a new clutch and from that and with some birds in captivity the species is, is back and increasing but the ducks are also very affected by diseases and there was a couple of years ago uh, an outbreak of um, um, uh, what do you call that in English well in the intestines um, a parasite which uh, wiped out uh, a large part of the population but they're coming back again and uh, they are very prolific laying many eggs so uh, there's a good chance that they will be will survive it's not one of these one egg species taking 10 years to become mature or anything like that so basically this was uh, a little bit about some of the rarest birds in the world we have a website, uh, BirdLife International, important, check that website, you will find more information and also a very good newsletter subscription you can do to your email address to get the latest information. Then uh, pixarc.com, uh, Tomasz Kofta's paintings are sold as fine prints, good quality prints there, if you're interested, uh, you can order them from that site, it's just been set up last week. Um, so. Are there any questions? <laughs> yeah. You saw it. Mm. Ball divers. Yes, that's it. Yes, the, uh, in, in Spain we saw the um, reintroduced use population, which is expanding rapidly. They think there's going to be 19 nests this year. Ah, okay. Wow. Well, they're just everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, it's brilliant. Did Most of the golf course. Yeah. <laughs> It used to occur all the, it also occurred in Austria, you know that? Mm -hmm. It's one of the first birds of the world which were protected because uh, Archbishop Leonard, was it? Uh, he wrote a decree that this species shall be protected. Uh, and that was in 1500 uh, something. So, uh, but it didn't help. It disappeared from Austria and mm -hmm. all the Mediterranean. But there are reintroduction projects in Spain, Italy, the Po Delta, uh, and there are Birds being bred in Sweden in a zoo and uh, also in Tarifa in, in Spain for reintroducing. And there's wild population in Turkey and Morocco. And the Turkish population and the Syri 
Syrian one, there are a few in Syria as well, who are not doing very well, but the Moroccan one is fairly stable. But it needs to be augmented and reintroduced. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, the yes. Spanish version, some have been seen in Portugal, some have been seen in Morocco. Oh ah, yeah. Okay, that's good. So they make contact mm -hmm. with the wild ones. Mm -hmm. Hmm? Okay, thank you.